Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Okay. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Okay, so I'm going to um, go over a couple things on the schedule. We've got a kind of a last push towards exam four and then it's review in the final exam. So um, we have homework 12 due tomorrow. And as I said last week, it's um, it's a little long, but the four there are four longer questions that are listed as practice. So I want you to be able to do those questions, but but if you um, but maybe it's not necessary to take the time to type in the full um uh the full um uh balanced chemical equations so i seem to be having some internet problems today it's telling me it's unstable so i'm gonna hope hopefully i'll be able to get through all of this um uh and then we have homework 13 due that is going to be on um, equilibrium this coming Friday it's set to but I can move that to the end of the weekend but I got to keep us moving so I don't want to put it past um, I don't want to I want to have it due before we meet again on Monday because Monday's the last chapter and um, yeah so today and Wednesday are going to be um, focused on equilibrium today I'll do a, I'll say a few things about equilibrium I have I did get to update my slides um, and I posted some links to some videos that I like. One of them's really pretty funny. Um, and then, so Wednesday come with questions on the equilibrium homework. And then Monday will be the last chapter, chapter 12, which is less quantitative and somewhat of a review. I think it will be helpful. And it's on intermolecular forces. We have to look at geometry and Lewis structures and things like, and polarity to talk about that. And then a week from Wednesday is exam four. How's everybody doing? What's your favorite? Email us at membership at jazz88.org and tell us, along with any silver mines you have noticed during these times. I'm going to melt you. Mute you, Bill, because I can hear you in the background. Or somebody. Can I, um, anybody got any questions so far? How's the acids and bases homework going? Don't like it. <laughs> Who is that? I don't like it. Do you have a question from it? I think. I think this is the most difficult. No, it's just a, 
There's a lot of stuff in that chapter. There is. There is. And, and if you read that, you spend 10 minutes writing that equation and get one little thing wrong, <laughs> well, don't throws do, you right out. Don't do that. Those are the questions that are practice. Focus on the ones where you don't have to do all that typing. I mean, you write, be able to write those on paper, but don't worry about um, don't worry about the points on the homework. Yeah, good. So don't worry about the points on the homework? No, some of them, there are four questions that take a long time that are only practice. They don't count towards your homework grade. Oh, oh, oh. And I want you to know that. You need to be able to write those balanced chemical equations for the exam, but I don't, I don't want you to waste your time typing them in. Now, are those questions identified in Pearson? It should tell you that it's for practice, because in the past, students have been able to tell which ones they are. Okay, maybe that's what I got hung up on. Yeah, there's four of them that are pretty long, but they're they're good questions. But I don't want you to waste your time on the typing part. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm if my connection were more stable, I would go and look to see uh, which numbers they are to tell you. But um, I'll write a note to myself. Yeah. I think you'll be able to tell. There was one. There was one that wanted to identify the bases and the acids, and then write the chemical equations. That that took some time. Oh, uh, there might be there might be one where you have to type, but I've tr I tried to uh, um, limit that. Okay, got one more person coming in. Okay, so um. Let me bring up the equilibrium slides. Move this over here. But these are a little too big for my screen. Hmm. I'm going to share a different way. Okay, so now you guys should see my PowerPoint slides. It says chemical equilibrium. Yes. Do you see the slide presentation now? I see it. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Oh my, this is going to be one of those days. Okay, so before we talk about chemical equilibrium, we have to talk about um, rates because we're we're not looking at overall rates of reactions when we talk about equilibrium, but we have to understand rates to understand what's going on with equilibrium. So a rate is a change of something um, per unit time, like could be distance, right? It, we have miles per hour. That is a change of distance per unit time and the time is hour. So, this is very slow. Oh, my slides are not advancing or changing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so miles per hour, and you could also have other things, like if you're a bakery and you have to have a certain number of loaves made in a day, you could have, your rate could be the number of loaves that you can make per hour, or in a fast food store, the number of hamburgers that could be made per hour. So when we talk about rates and chemical, um, chemical reactions, um, we have to think about what kinds of things have to happen for a chemical reaction to occur. So here's this reaction here. It's hydrogen gas reacting with iodine to make hydrogen iodide, two molecules. So what has to happen for a reaction to occur? 
somebody speak because I can't pull up my chat window right now. <laughs> All right, if I've got H2 and I've got I2, if they never touch, they can't form a bond, right? Right. Right, so the molecules have to collide and they, so that if they don't collide, a reaction cannot occur. And a couple things have to be special about the collision. There has to be enough energy when they collide so that the bonds between the H atoms and the bonds between the iodine atoms break and they have to collide in the right orientation. Um, and that's all part of collision theory. So in collision theory, the, it says that the rates of reaction are dependent upon a couple of things. The, the molecules have to collide, they have to be in the proper orientation, and they have to collide in a way that there's enough energy to break the bonds that are gonna be broken in order to form the new ones. And because we are thinking of things in terms of rates, um, we have to think of in terms of what things will increase the number of collisions. Okay, so here are things that can affect rates of reactions. The concentration of our reactants, right? If you if we're thinking about collisions between the H2 and the I2, if we increase the concentration of hydrogen gas, that means there's more gas molecules available to collide with the iodine gas molecules. And then we should get more collisions per unit time. So increasing the concentration of reactants increases the rate of a reaction. Likewise, if we increase the temperature, an increase in the temperature makes the molecules move faster. If they're moving faster, then they're going to collide more often per unit time. So increasing the temperature increases the rate of a reaction. And also the opposite is true. If you decrease the temperature or you decrease the concentration of reactants, the rate of the reaction will slow down. Um, so when we talk about equilibrium, equilibrium is this case where you have um, reactions going in both the forward and the reverse direction. So it turns out most reactions are what we call reversible. That means that they can proceed in the forward direction and the reverse direction. And so if you start out with only reactants, as products build up, they will react and reform reactants. And when you have reached equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is the same as the rate of the backward reaction. I'm gonna, this is, we'll see how this goes. Do you guys, do you guys see YouTube now? What do, you, do you see a TED talk? Yes. You do? Okay. I see it. I see the prompts, but no video yet. Oh, okay. No, no. Let me. I it's gotta, still the slides. Okay. Yeah. I got to change the share. Okay. Say two people are walking down the street and they bump into each other. They'll just shake it off and walk on. Sometimes that happens with molecules too. They just bounce off each other and that's that. But what if two people were to bump into each other and during that collision, one person's arm got severed and reattached to the other person's face? Now that sounds really weird, but it's similar to one, one of the many ways that molecules can react with each other. Two molecules can join and become one. One can split apart and become two. Molecules can switch parts. 
All these changes are chemical reactions, and we can see them happening around us. For example, when fireworks explode, or iron rusts, or milk goes bad, or people are born, grow old, die, and then decompose. But chemical reactions don't just happen willy-nilly. Everything has to be right. First, the molecules have to hit each other in the right orientation. And second, they have to hit each other hard enough, in other words, with enough energy. Now, you're probably thinking that a reaction just happens in one direction, and that's it. Sometimes that's true. For example, things can't unburn or unexplode. But most reactions can happen in both directions, forward and reverse. There's no reason that our face arm guy can't bump into armless girl, reattaching that arm back to its original socket. Now, let's zoom out a bit. Now, let's say that you've got a thousand people on the street, and all of them start with their limbs normally attached. At the beginning, every collision is a chance for person A to transfer an arm to person B's face. And so at the beginning, more and more people end up with arms attached to their faces or arms missing. But as the number of people with arm faces and missing arms grows, collisions between those people become more likely. And when they bump into each other, guess what? Normal appendage people are reproduced. Now the number of limb transfers per second forward will start high and then fall and the number of limb transfers per second backward will start at zero and then rise. Eventually, they'll meet, they'll be the same. And when that happens, the number of people in each state stops changing, even though people are still bumping into each other and exchanging limbs. Now, how many people do you think there are in each state? Half and half, right? No, well, maybe, it depends. It could be 50-50, but it could be 60-40 or 1585 or anything. We chemists have to get our little gloved hands dirty. Uh, well, it, we're in a lab, so not really dirty, to figure out what the actual distribution of molecules is. Even though each of these limb transfers is a pretty dramatic event for the people involved, if we zoom out, we see population numbers that don't change. We call this nirvana equilibrium, and it doesn't just happen with chemical reactions. Things like gene pools and highway traffic show the same pattern. It looks pretty still from 30,000 feet, but there is lots of crazy stuff happening on the ground. You just need to zoom in to see it. Okay. Um, let me go to a different screen share. Close that. Where's my, there it is. There's also um, another good video that talks about equilibrium as well. So um, the car parking lot one is a little bit, actually that one you can manipulate, it's kind of fun. But um, this one is only a minute and a half, the first one. And it, it goes over another example. Okay, so uh, this this slide is showing you how um, it's actually it's it's talking more about rates than equilibrium. You have in this reaction A and B as reactants and C as product, and if you look in this first frame at zero time, it's all reactants and no product. But after 15 seconds, there's three products and a lot less reactants. And then by 30 seconds, it's all product. This is not showing you equilibrium because we're not seeing the back reaction yet. But this is a fast reaction in comparison to the one on the right. The re reaction on the right has a slower rate. The reactants are um, in purple and yellow in this one, and the product is brown. And in the beginning, we see um, no product. At 15 seconds, we see one product, whereas with the faster reaction, there were three products, and the products build in slowly over time. So that this is a, a contrast between a fast reaction and a slow reaction. Um, and this is illustrating how when you have low initial concentration, you have a slow rate because these molecules are less likely to bump into each other. If you have 
an intermediate level of concentration, you'll have an intermediate rate. And then at the highest concentrations of reactant, you'll have the highest um, initial rate. Once you get to equilibrium, the concentrations of reactants and products don't change. That's how you know that something's at equilibrium. Because you get a certain amount of buildup of product and the product goes back to, once there's enough product, the back reaction gets faster and faster. Because when we think of the back reaction, our product is now the reactants. And at equilibrium, the concentrations don't change, but it does not mean that they are equal. Um, but we can quantify the concentrations. Let me, let me just make sure I've got everybody still. Okay. And, okay, one more thing. Let me show you this. So in terms of trying to understand um, how uh, equilibrium concentrations are not equal to each other. If the, I actually have a, like a live demo I do in class, um, but we don't have that opportunity this semester. But the example I like to give is think about um, a ski area, right? You have you have skiers on the bottom of the hill in the morning. Maybe there's there's a lot because everybody arrives at the slope at the time that they open. And the lift brings people up to the top in the morning, right? And then people, people get on their skis and they ski down the hill. And in the beginning, the net change is going to be almost entirely uphill because there's nobody at the top of the mountain and um, people are only going up. But at some point during the day, hopefully, people are skiing down at the same rate that they're skiing up and you get to some equilibrium level of concentration where the line, hopefully the line for the ski lift isn't very long because the rate of people going up is the rate of people going down. And it could actually be that there's more people at the top because people can take various routes down than there are at the bottom. So, um, so, so you could have 100 people on top and maybe 20 on the bottom, but as long as the number of people going down is the same as the rate of the number of people going up, those numbers will not change. It's sort of a difficult concept to grasp at first, um, but just remember that equilibrium concentrations don't change. They do not change, um, but they don't have to be equal. Now, um, let me see what else was I going to say here. Oh, it's also important to remember we call this a dynamic equilibrium because even though it looks like the it looks like nothing's happening because the concentrations aren't changing. In reality, there's people skiing down the hill and people getting carried up on the lift. And that's what's the part that refers to as dynamic, meaning things are happening, but we, on a macroscopic level, we can't really see it. Mm. How did I get all the way to there? Okay. Okay, so we can we can actually quantify the concentrations at equilibrium and um, we do this using an equilibrium constant.
So the equilib equilibrium constant is called K and it Okay, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay, when did you guys lose me? <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about the, the equilibrium constant, K. Okay, so I made it through the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so let me see. So the equilibrium constant K, it's called KEQ. Let me get rid of that. It's called KEQ and the concentration in these brackets, these square brackets mean concentration. So this means the reaction here are hypothetical and C and D are product divided by the ratio of the reactants. It's in the balanced chemical equation. And so you rate a uh, constant, but in general, it's products over reactants. And the values from processes are often, they're, they're very large or very, very small, depending upon how you look at the numbers, meaning like you can have 10 to the minus six as the exponent for your equilibrium value of K. And it's dinitrogen pentoxide, two of them reacting um, oxygen gas. And so concentrations under equilibrium uh, conditions and NO2 would be raised to the power four because it has a stoichiometric coefficient of one divided by the concentration of the reactants squared. This is how you would write it for this reaction. And I just wanna go over, hmm. Can I say this differently? Oh, so the PUS, um, because it's products divided by reactants, when you have a large value of K meaning greater than one, like a reaction goes mostly to products, that the concentration in the numerator where products are is much bigger than the concentration in the K meaning that the concentrations of reactants are large. And so a small value of K, something with an exponent of like 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, those mean that the reaction does not go very far to products. And this is just to remind you that it's products divided by react of the different species in the reaction. Yeah. Um, hold on, guys. Do you think uh, is it a useful Your class? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, guys. My daughter. Every time she logs in, I get booted out. Um, I got to work on that. Okay. Okay, so here is, okay. Um, so here's an equation. And if you put in these numbers, you'll get the equilibrium constant. And that's what's shown on this slide here. So you, you may wanna practice being able to use the up caret for exponents. So for any reaction, the equilibrium concentrations depend on the initial concentrations of reactants or products, but um, the value of the equilibrium constant will always be the same. 
So here's, here's a table that shows you concentrations of hydrogen iodine and hydrogen iodide initially, and then what they are at equilibrium. And notice they're not all the same at equilibrium, but when you put them into the, um, into the equilibrium constant equation, the, number all, the numbers all come out the same. That's, that's always true, Professor? Yes, if the numbers are not the same as the equilibrium constant, then your system is not at equilibrium and it's headed towards equilibrium. Okay. Yeah, and the equilibrium constant is a constant. If it's run at different temperatures, you vastly different temperatures, the equilibrium constant value will change, but, but we never deal with that here. You guys can always assume that the equilibrium constant is not going to change. Okay, now um, one thing that's important to know is that when you have heterogeneous equilibria, that means that you have some pure solids and pure liquids in your equilibrium process, we do not include those in the equilibrium expression because the solids and liquids are so high in concentration relative to the, um, to the other reactants, we, we treat them as if they don't change and they're part of the constant. So if you look at this reaction down here, I have CO2 gas and water, which is a liquid, and react to form H plus and bicarbonate, which are both aqueous. We will include in the equilibrium constant, the CO2, it's down here, reactants go in the denominator. There's no water though, because it's a liquid. And then we have the H plus and the HCO3 minus in the numerator. So always remember, if you see a liquid or a solid, it does not get included into the equilibrium expression. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. And this is the example I like to go over. Think about this process here. This, is, this arrow is meant to be an equilibrium arrow. Sucrose is regular table sugar, and maybe I'm trying to dissolve it into my tea, right? So I have solid sugar, I'm dropping a teaspoon into, of it into my tea, and then when it dissolves, it becomes aqueous. Now, some, most of the time, you wind up with some solid sucrose on the bottom of your glass of tea. And when that happens, you're at equilibrium between the solid state and the aqueous state. Um, and, but the equilibrium constant would reflect only the concentration of what's aqueous, what's dissolved, which is sort of interesting, right? So your equilibrium concentrations, and this is, um, this is talking, uh, are only dependent upon what's in solution. It doesn't matter what's a solid. And so what that says is that if you are adding more solid, it does not shift the equilibrium towards more aqueous. So that means that if you, continue to add teaspoons of sugar to your tea after you see solid on the bottom, you're not bringing any more of it into solution. You're just accumulating more on the bottom of the tea. But it's also important to remember that, let me see if I can do this. I've got my tea and I've got my sugar on the bottom and some of it's going into solution and some of the tea that some of the sugar that's aqueous is going is becoming solid there's a continuous it's dynamic it's going some some solid sugar is dissolving and some aqueous is coming out of solution it's a dynamic equilibrium it will look the same to the eye like the same sugar is on the bottom at all times but it's it's actually a continuous exchange but the important thing is, if you add more sugar in the solid form, it does not make any more of it go into solution. That's how equilibria work. And that's because the sugar is a solid. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? So the, the, the next big part of the chapter is looking at things that change the equilibrium. So if you have a system that's at equilibrium, you can do things to perturb it. 
and the the guiding principle for predicting how changes occur is called Le Chatelier's principle. And um, it allows us to predict how a system at equilibrium will respond. And a system at equilibrium will respond in a way to reestablish equilibrium. I'm going to go to the camera. Okay, let me. Um, okay, so let's say you have an equilibrium process A plus B makes C plus D. And our equilibrium expression, let's see if I can change, change the school. There. Our equilibrium expression for this would be K is equal to the concentration of C times the concentration of D divided by the concentration of reactants, A and B. And remember, at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backwards reaction. And we can have an equilibrium expression or equilibrium constant of, with a value of a thousand, that would mean that there's a thousand times more what's, um, than there is of, of C and D than there is of A and B. But if I do something to perturb the equilibrium, I could increase the concentration of A, right? So I have, at this point, I'm at equilibrium, I haven't added anything, the rates are equal. But if I increase the concentration of A, then I'm gonna increase the number of collisions between A and B. When that happens, that's gonna increase the rate of the forward reaction. So now the forward reaction is bigger, the back reaction hasn't changed. And because the rate of the forward reaction is now greater than the rate of the reverse reaction, we get a shift in concentrations toward product. So if you increase the concentration of a reactant, there'll be a shift towards product in your equilibrium. I could also increase the concentration of a product. So maybe I increase the concentration of C. If I increase the concentration of C, then what happens is there's more collisions between C and D. and more of the possibility uh, for reactions to take place. And when that happens, there's an increase in the rate of the reverse reaction. And I could represent that like this, right? So my reverse reaction is greater than my forward. And so the net, um, the net effect is that there will be a shift, I'll draw it this way a shift towards reactants. Any questions? Okay, so when we think about perturbing a system at equilibrium, what you wanna do is um, think about how the shift will impact the rates of the forward and the rates of the reverse reactions.
So if I decrease the concentration of a reactant, decrease the concentration of A, then what happens is the rate of the forward reaction slows down, right? There's less collisions. The rate of the forward reaction decreases. And so now forward reaction is this, back reaction is that. There's going to, the equilibrium is going to shift towards reactants to replenish it, to reestablish balance. So think of it as a shift to replace the A that was taken away. Um, so Professor, uh -huh. if, if the rate of the four reaction decreases, that does have no effect on the reverse direction for C and D, correct? Exactly. We haven't, at, at, at the time that we made that change, we didn't change the concentrations of C and D. So that reverse reaction has the same rate, but the forward reaction is less. And so now we are making more A and B than we are getting rid of um, A and B. So the, it will shift to increase the concentrations of A and B until equilibrium is reestablished. It's not quite the same, but another way I think about it is a bank account, right? We have a certain amount of money we like to keep in our bank accounts and there's money coming in and there's money going out. If the amount of money going out is faster than what comes in, then the, our balance drops, right. right? And if the amount of money coming in is greater than the amount of money going out, our balance increases. So, so Professor, if this forward rate decreases and you have, you know, and the uh, products going in the worst direction does not, when will they reach equilibrium? C and D is still making the same amount. Yes, but it's making it faster than A and B are, are um, leaving, right? Right. So it will catch up. It depends on the rate constants. Okay. Yeah. So eventually C and D are going to slow down also, correct? Yes. As that's what happens. So as C and D, um, their concentrations will decrease as A and B are replenished. Okay. And eventually you get to some point where the con the relative ratios equals the equilibrium constant and then the rate of forward and the rate of reverse are the same. That's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So another thing to think about in terms that we have to talk about for Le Chatelier's principle is if you have um, if you have an exothermic reaction, that means heat is a product. This one was the hardest one for me to understand. So we have an exothermic reaction, heat is a product. Heat is released. And it wasn't until I started thinking about putting it on the product side of the reaction that things made sense to me. If I decrease the temperature of my reaction that's exothermic, the equilibrium is going to seek to replace that temperature. And so it will shift towards the heat. Right? If this is an exothermic reaction and the temperature decreases, making more product produces more heat. So it will shift to products. If I increase the temperature, it's kind of like making more product and the equilibrium will shift to decrease that effect and it will shift towards reactants. So that's if it's an exothermic reaction. If it's endothermic, it's all the reverse. So if I have an endothermic reaction, that's one that requires heat. And we can think of heat as a reactant. So 
So if I have an endothermic reaction and I increase the temperature, that's sort of like increasing a reactant, the equilibrium will shift to products to get rid of that extra heat. And if you decrease the temperature, it's going to shift to replace that heat. So it will shift towards reactants. Okay. Let me go back to the slides. Let's see how this goes. Okay, so predicting qualitative changes to equilibrium. So um, if a system is at equilibrium, what happens when it's disturbed? Le Chatelier, Le Chatelier's principle allows us to make qualitative predictions about how it will respond. And the system is going to shift to minimize the disturbance to reestablish equilibrium. Those two videos, the Khan Academy one is long <laughs> and it gets to be more quantitative, but it's a good description. And then this one is relatively short. I highly, highly recommend it. If you're struggling with it, um, Khan Academy is always a 15 minute video. This one is like three. Um, so the things we have to look at are um, adding and removing a reactant product. If you have a gas reaction, we have to look at the pressure. Look at it just the same as um, concentrations. If you increase the volume of a gas, you are decreasing the concentration, and it will follow the same trends, and then changing the temperature. So this is all stuff that I just went over. If we add or remove a reactant to um, or product to a system at equilibrium, we are changing the concentrations. So if you increase the concentration of reactants, you are increasing the number of collisions between reactions, and the rate of the rate of the forward reaction will increase, and it shifts towards products. And um, as Bill reminded, nothing happens to the reverse reaction. So at this case, now the rate of the forward is greater than the rate of the reverse. So the equilibrium will shift in a direction that will partially consume the reactant in this case, or, um, or replace if it had been reduced. And this is just showing that if you add more reactants, you get more collisions and it will shift to the right. And if you add a product, it will shift to the left. So changing volume is related to changing pressure, remember. So if you decrease the volume, you're increasing the pressure. And the reducing, reducing the volume of a gas um, in reaction shifts the equilibrium to, um, so, so if you reduce the volume, you increase the pressure. When you increase the pressure, the equilibrium will try to reduce the number of moles of gas. So if we look at this, this is the Haber process here. Nitrogen plus three hydrogen molecules makes two ammonia molecules. On the reactant side, there are four moles of gas. On the product side, there are only two moles of gas. And so if you decrease the volume, a decrease in the volume is an increase in pressure, the equal, equilibrium will shift to the side that has fewer gas molecules to pressure. So it will shift to the right because there are molecules here and only two there. Decrease the pressure, they will to products. And then the reverse is you increase the volume, and this is an increase in pressure. Again, you 